So we have two people that are going to be presenting for the next talk. Cyber floor cleaner. My prop. All right. We have a prop. Look, see, you know, this kind of isn't fair. Like, I should make the subsequent <laughs> presenters, like, they have to sit outside the room because they see what we give points for. And then they're like, hey, let's grab a mop. <laughs> let's go for I'm it. I'm saying he had this mustache. Hold on. Oh, wait a minute. Wait, do we have a mustache? I'm not saying he had this mustache when he awesome. walked in, but he has an amazing Plus one mustache for the real beard. beard. I grew it in the last five minutes. Grew it in the fat past five minutes. Yeah. I have no... Um, but, so just to introduce their talk here, so the CISO role, um, you know, if you read their abstract, this was created over 20 years ago or more. Oh yeah, and it's going to be like plus 50 because they have no slides. Yes. So you're going to have to turn your neck. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, no, I'm just kidding. Um, but. You know, and their primary thesis is that they created this role so that there's a focus on security, but has it really made security better? You know, maybe, maybe not. If not, would there have been a more appropriate role that, that those responsibilities could have been assigned to? Uh, but that's not for me to contemplate here. This evening, we are graced with the presence of these two gentlemen. Fine, one, <laughs> one past CISO and, and one, I think, upcoming CISO that are going to contemplate this. So we have uh, Alexander Romero. Yeah. Like Raise your hand, please, because they need to know. All right. And then Steve. Um, Luzinski. Luzinski. As easy as it looks. Thank you. That's what I was going to say. Spanky so. works also. All right. The past, representing the past and the present in this next fire talk. Gentlemen, please proceed. Thank you, very uh, appreciate that. Uh, welcome to our talk. The title is, uh, first of all, let's kill all the scissors and for all the Shakespeare fans out there, uh, maybe you see where that comes from. We're replacing the lawyers. Good, we got one, thank you. And uh, my Google search is what led me to that, so thank you can confirm that's a, a good search, exactly. So let me uh, start off the talk, first of all. I think what's all on our minds right now, the correct pronunciation. Is it CISO? Raise your hand. CISO, there's a couple hands, Bo, you're, you're wrong. Uh, or is it CISO? That's right, good, because that's how I'm going to pronounce it for the rest of the talk. So thank you for uh, uh, agreeing with me on that one. Sorry, Alex. It's fine. So uh, good evening, Shmoo. My name's Steve Luzinski. I just retired from the Air Force. I spent 25 years. I got to fly uh, F-15s, F-22s, had a great time doing that, and uh, got into cybersecurity about 10 years ago. My last assignment was at the Pentagon. Uh, as an Air Force guy in uniform, but I worked on the civilian side of the department. So my primary job in cyber policy was how do I talk to the technical folks who are on the keyboard and they want to do things, they want to execute military operations using their cyber skills to get things done. And how do I translate that so what they're doing meets what national leaders want to do and what the rest of government wants to do. So that's where I came out of when I retired. Since then, now I've moved on. I work at T-Rex Solutions, IT, tech integration across different government agencies. We're leading the 2020 census. And my new job, I'm a CISO. All right. Uh, so I'm Alex Romero. Um, I'm a tinkerer. I was a former Marine, a federal contractor, civilian. Uh, an entrepreneur, B-Sides goon, organizer. I'm usually on the other side of the cameras, and I hate that I'm in front of them right now. Um, <laughs> Uh, lately, I've been an CISO um, at uh, the Defense Media Activity, and I um, am now currently working at the Defense Digital Service to try to improve technology within the DoD. Um, standard caveat, my thoughts are my own. I'm not representing my employer. Um, Me too. You know, yeah. <laughs> so imagine, if you will, an experienced CISO, a new CISO, and a hacker, Bo, who contributed greatly to our thinking on this, walk into a bar. And uh, they sit down and they decide to have some cocktails and they are funnier than they've ever been. They're wittier than they've ever been. <laughs> they didn't decide whether or not they were good dancers. They left that to the side. But during their session at the bar, they realized no kid grows up thinking, I want to be a CISO. 
Who in here is a CISA? Raise your hand. Oh, awesome. All three of us. That's perfect. <laughs> so if you think about it, what do I want to do when I grow up? Have you ever heard any kids say, policeman, fireman, fighter pilot, no way, I want to be a CISO. That's my dream. I was in the bar in Lobby Con. A friend of mine introduces me, a very nice lady, and she's like, what do you do? And I'm like, I'm a CISO. She laughed heartily from <laughs> the belly and diaphragm at the fact that I said it. And I was excited because I'm the new guy. So, and that's probably why she's laughing at me. Exactly. So, so we started thinking about that and the problem with that. And if no kid wants to be that, then why do we have them? And again, in our very creative state where we're wittier than we've ever been and we're funnier than we've ever been, we start thinking about how do we fix this problem? The number one solution was to build a Terminator unit, send it back to the 90s, find all the people who were involved in CISO, that's a great idea, and take care of business. <laughs> now, it's pretty much a foolproof plan. The only problem that we found, the biggest limitation is, we don't know how to do robot stuff. So that, we had to throw out the window. Um, the other good idea that came out, the second place idea, was a hot tub time machine. And none of us wanted to be together in a hot tub. So we decided to come here tonight, and that's our fire talk. So, Alex? All right. So if at some point in the future the CISO, CISO position had ceased to exist, what would it have taken to make that happen? Um, so we all come to these conferences for different reasons. Maybe to hear the latest uh, gnarly hack, connect with friends, that's my favorite thing to do. Explore new tools, techniques, uh, at the heart of what we do though lies our curiosity, I think, to learn something new and to solve interesting problems. Not just cyber problems, one. Uh, there are much larger societal problems that need the hacker way of thinking. Everything from hackers running as politicians to solving world hunger, uh, I think the world would be better served if uh, you know, we were someday able to take that raw talent and apply it towards other problems. Um, so our goals in the talk are simply to spur the conversation. This is a conversation starter. Initially, it was like murdering all CISOs. We had like a bunch of different topics that we were trying to cover, but we were also drunk. Um, <laughs> so <laughs> I wasn't drunk. I think we were all pretty toasty. Anyway, right, maybe. Um, so simply spur the conversation. Um, maybe how combining the CISO CISO role is necessary, and how merging these roles with the CIO. Uh, positions could be beneficial. And um, also how to, how to change security outcomes, not just for our community, uh, but for society at large. And also stop the infighting between West Coast, East Coast, Crips, Bloods, right? Um, <laughs> since the first CISOs went to work in the 90s, how much has InfoSec actually improved? Uh, has it improved because of or in spite of the existence of that position? Um, have CIOs continued to buy shit that, that, that then gets their organization in trouble? Or do they listen to their security folks when they are told some engineering or system, desi uh, system design is flawed? I've seen a lot of that. Um, let's think about the costs of InfoSec. Um, so we are forecasted to spend over $1 trillion in the next five years. Uh, thanks, Atlantic Council, for get it, getting us that uh, information. Um, but uh, we have still an expected, if not actual, 100% failure rate in securing our systems from Bryson's talk earlier given enough time, right? Uh, Rob Joyce, I think, left the room already. I saw him back there, but he gave a talk at Enigma uh, several years ago about how the NSA penetrates into adversary networks. And the TLDR version is simply that they take the time to learn the adversary's network better than the adversaries themselves. Um, but are there any organizations that you can think of that actually do that? Probably not many. So uh, numbers show that the average CISO stays in a position for 18 months but the implementation of their plans take 24 months. And once they leave, there is very little or no accountability for their actions, good or bad, God bless you. Uh, while they, well, while they are there, the average CISO gets paid around a quarter million dollars on up. Uh, perhaps that money would be more beneficial to design systems in a more secure way than depend on any one individual to be the fall guy. So I personally have friends in the industry that have told me that they'd be willing to be a scapegoat for a company for the right price, because sometimes that's all a company is looking for, is just a scapegoat. Uh, but what is the real cost for a scapegoat? Um, perhaps users and their sensitive data are better served by actually designing security into systems from the get-go, analyzing and teaching programmers how to better write code, or spending money on red teams and bug bounties. Uh, 
to have, at least at a very minimum, to find those vulns, create a culture of change, and establish a security mindset throughout organizations. Uh, inversely, what are the lost opportunity costs? Had that time been better spent on true innovation, uh, not to say that the cyber career field is void of innovation, but you know, doing things like going to Mars, et cetera. So um, I've come to the realization since we first convened that perhaps we can't kill all the CISOs, that even though it's not a child's dream to become a CISO, they are a necessary evil. And if nothing else, at least they're somebody uh, to fire. So <laughs> I'm feeling really good right now. Uh, so if, uh, as we went through our analysis, it was incredibly in-depth. Uh, lots of bar napkins were involved. We looked at none of the other alternatives. We did no statistical regression efforts whatsoever. There wasn't an ounce of math involved. And we came up with two assumptions that we are questioning and we're going to throw out, and that's what we're going to talk about here with you tonight. The first assumption is... The reason why you have a CISO in an organization is because nobody else has the technical skills, the prowess and expertise to do what a CISO does, so you have to have them there. Alex, very experienced CISO, he's been around the block, he is a big believer in having that technical expertise in the CISO position. I on the other hand, and I'm not one to brag, so bear with me for a moment. I have been in my job for 18 days, <laughs> counting the weekends, so I'll give you that. And yes, counting the government day off we had, I get it, fine. And I had to count the snow delays and all of that. But 18 fulfilling days in my CISO job. <laughs> Good luck with that. <laughs> I appreciate that. that. Thank you. And uh, so my observation is from my experience before that and now I'm starting to see is that that technical prowess isn't always required depending on the company, depending on the situation, and how, about, how you go about doing your CISO job. So, yeah, so I think the uh, key in choosing a less technical CISO uh, is making sure you have the technical skills around you, right, and that you regularly consult with them and others like them in the field. So places like this, ask good questions. Exactly, and, and something that I realized even in going into the job is exactly like what Alex said. It's not that we're talking about not having the technical skills, but if you happen to be in the position that you don't have those yourself, surround yourself, make sure the company, the organization, wherever you are, has those technical people. And then if you're the one that's making the decisions, you have to talk to them. You have to understand what they're doing and what they want to do. They are the technical experts. You aren't. You might be the leader, but you have to open yourself up to trusting what they say, the expertise that you all bring, so that it gets moved up and done correctly within the organization. So if you have that less technical CISO, and the idea is the trend that a lot of companies are looking at I want my CISO to do the risk management. I want my CISO, and it was mentioned earlier, to translate what are you all doing on the keyboards down there in the basement? And how does that affect the executives up in the corporate leadership and the C-suite? And what does that mean to my business? And translating between the two of those worlds. This is a C-suite that isn't necessarily experienced with cybersecurity. They're excited they got a brand new Facebook account and they can see what their teenager's doing. So they're not necessarily dialed into things and they think about them different. So the CISO job in a lot of respects is changing over. So if that's the case, does the CISO go away because those skills, that technical expertise and that risk management can be done by somebody else? A lot of companies, especially the bigger ones, have chief risk officers, and that's their job is risk management. So do we move all those risk management skills over there? Well, what about the technical expertise? Well, if they have a CIO that understands security and is willing to balance that with getting the job done operating the network, maybe that's another way that you farm out the CISO skills, and then you don't need a CISO in that case. Could be an opportunity to save money for the business. If you think about that, now let's flip it the other way. Instead of moving those skills out somewhere else, let's take the CISO, who's just the security person, and let's teach them what is risk management. And now maybe you don't need the chief risk officer. You've got a CISO who knows both. Or the CISO understands the technology and can do the CIO's job, and they move into that position. So think about it this way. What's easier to do? 
teach somebody with a business background and an MBA how to do the technical stuff, I'm not buying that one, or teach the technical person how to do the business stuff and move them up. So it's a different way to think about it, and that's what we're asking you to consider from there. The other assumption that we came up with, again, with all of our extensive analysis and uh, a lot of statistics involved, is the assumption that everything will always be vulnerable, there'll always be things to fix, and that's why you need a CISO. Humanity will find a way to screw it up. So you have to have a CISO there to take care of that. Let's get crazy, and every single cyber moonshot that Bo talked about gets funded, it's agreed to, and they're successful. Not likely, I get it, but you're saying there's a chance. What if it does, we all go to the bar, we're done. Everything's secure, we have nothing to worry about anymore. Chances of that are low, I get it, but if we shift our focus into the ideal world and how do we get there, we have a good balance in general of folks designing things to be secure at the beginning, and there's a bigger push to understand the value of that, and folks that are finding the vulnerabilities and fixing them. That's never going to go away. But what if we start talking about the value of pushing more time and energy into building it securely to begin with, into getting that moving early on, because that's more time, more energy, more money, more resources later that are saved, that you're not just finding and fixing things after the fact. And that's what we're talking about, shifting the way we're thinking about it, taking all of this expertise and pushing it into something better. And eventually, if everything starts becoming more and more secure, we're spending less and less time finding and fixing things, what do we do with that new untapped resource of time, energy, innovative thinking that now can go look at what's the next space race? How do we do better with quantum computing? How do we leverage things like mathematically proven that something's secure and find other ways to prove it's secure, to build on the open source experience to improve security? And now we can do better at that. Or let's stop worrying about cybersecurity related things and let's just go get clean water to a village because we've got people that have the ability to go put their energies towards that. That's what we're talking about, thinking about a different way of why this would be a useful endeavor. So in conclusion, some final thoughts. Um, so what if instead of airbags, you had spikes in front of you in your car, right? So believe it or not, this was actually suggested when the idea of airbags were first proposed, that it would make people drive in an unsafe manner because they would feel safe, right? Um, but you can imagine how carefully people would drive if that were the case. Um, so maybe we should make it more costly uh, for anyone who allows insecure systems to propagate. Um, imagine how carefully everyone would uh, pay more attention to system vulnerabilities, finding them in advance. Uh, is increasing the pain actually the answer? It may not necessarily be the solution, but it could be part of, uh, part of a larger solution. Also elevating the CISO position and surround them with smart engineers that are able to speak plainly to real risk so they sit on those boards and their opinions are respected. Um, and this is a noble cause, we're running low in time, um, and we want you to reconsider what, why we do what we do, um, what is truly worth our time and effort as a potential benefit to society while we continue our current efforts to hack all the things. I'll throw out just from a military background, we have to think through this problem all the way through. You can't just tear things down. You have to figure out how to build them up. If you're putting all the CISOs out of work, you got a lot of disgruntled employees and you're probably going to have an insurgency on your hands. So you have to be very careful. There's also going to be a corresponding uh, drop in the levels of available liquor in certain areas. So if you can take that talent and energy and put it towards manufacturing more of those needed items, we'll all live happier. So thank you for your time. Let's appreciate it. Perfect. <laughs> Perfect time. All right, so uh, we'll have to uh, push the questions till afterwards. They were very well prepared. They had, like, you couldn't see it from your vantage point, but they literally had all their talking points and they had the times and like, hey, we should be here at 13 minutes, here at 14 minutes, yeah. And uh, so, Why just put my hoodie on. <laughs> Sorry, it was Sorry. awesome. Costume, costume. costume yeah. yeah. <laughs> Pl plus three for the costume. All you right. dress like a hacker with a hoodie. No. Right. <laughs> Star Wars. Um, but yeah, so like it was very well planned. So uh, plus two on that, and also, and I don't know why a lot of speakers, and also why. 
there's a lot of people that want to speak, um, but they're afraid, right? And, you, you know, if you're just starting out, take advantage of the two pa of the two person format. Um, you know, it's a lot easier. So, so, so that's a good tip for those that are starting um, out there. Um, so I love the back and forth. It just, you know, makes it more exciting for, not exciting, but um, yeah, it just adds, adds a lot of, uh, makes the presentation more dynamic if to, I, I've heard that somewhere, but I don't know. Um, so love that. Um, so that was a plus one. Uh, yeah. And then, and then plus one for no slides. Like I do a lot of training and my goal, and, and I haven't been able to do this yet, but because the customers want stupid slides, but like my goal is to be, do like like a four or five day class with no slides, you know, because 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 that's the number one comment that we always get back, or just like hate the slides, love the labs, right? So I, I don't know. So I appreciate that you had no slides, so plus one for that. So thank you. So yeah, I'm happy to go next. So first of all, thank you both very much for your service to the country. We all really appreciate that. Um, some of the best ideas do come from, from um, bar napkins. I have a story to tell about the framework for improving critical infrastructure, but I won't up here. Um, but, but it is a good tool for you all to, th to think about um, as you're trying to talk to um, people in senior management all the way down to the bits and, and bytes folks. So um, I, and, and I did appreciate the, the real heavy emphasis on the risk management approach. I thought you all did a great job. Mm -hmm. yep. Okay, plus five for going slide commando. Slide commando, everybody. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, no, it was amazing. Uh, plus one for the Shakespeare, I enjoyed. Um, Minus three, wrong pronunciation. It's CISO for e information security. I mean, it's e information, right? Yeah, it's perfectly logical, and I'm a judge, so shh. Anyway, plus two, great storytelling. I enjoyed that. Uh, plus one for the Terminator reference, come with me if you want to patch, you know? I mean, really. Um, plus two for a drop in the stats about the average CISO's lifespan being 18 months and the average project being 24 months with no consequences and usually a pay raise and some sort of a parachute that's made of metal, a precious metal, anyway. Um, so plus two for that. Uh, plus one for saying this out loud, uh, people are willing to be scapegoats for money. Yeah, total scam, I mean seriously. Wait, why didn't anybody offer me this? Oh, anyway, but people are willing to do that. But other people, other people are willing to do that. Um, plus one for admitting the bar napkin drunken assumptions of CISOs. CISOs, yeah. <laughs> but plus one for admitting that, because honestly, the number of conversations I've had with CISOs, um, where they, they spout off some, well, clearly it's this, and I'm like, you made that up in a bar on a napkin, and they're like, yeah, and it's the smartest thing ever, even though you've got 20 years experience in this, I'm just gonna tell you what I wrote down on a napkin. And yeah, okay, so if you count it all up, it was a plus 13, minus three for a score of 10, but there's two of you, I divided by two, you've got a five total. That's all right. Maybe. Yeah, for those that haven't, is this on? Can you uh -oh. hear me? This one's on. This one's on. Oh, maybe. Somebody turned it off. How dare they? <laughs> okay, it works. So for those of you that haven't noticed, this is the to-be-judged chair. So just wanted to point that out. <laughs> 